Hi, everybody. I'm Allison Williams, the Copper Queen Library Services Coordinator, and um, I am very excited to welcome Ken Lamberton here tonight. I also just want to make one quick announcement, which is that the Copper Queen Library is a National Medal of Museum and Library Services finalist. This is uh, the highest national uh, honor for libraries and museums in the country. And uh, what's really wonderful is that they celebrate uh, the finalists for the next two months before the winners are announced in the beginning of June. So we just wanna thank all of you, our patrons and uh, people who do our programs and lead our programs and our friends at the Copper Queen Library and all of our staff um, for all being part of sharing this honor um, to be a National Medal finalist. So I want to thank all of you guys too for that. Um, and I uh, just wanted to say a little bit about Ken. Ken Lamberton um, is an American writer, an artist, and naturalist. He is the author of several celebrated nonfiction books, including Wilderness, and Razor Wire, both of which are available at the Copper Queen Library. And Razor Wire won the 2002 John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing. And Ken holds uh, degrees in both biology and creative writing from the University of Arizona. And he lives in an amazing 1890s stone cottage in Arizona's historic mountain borderlands. And, and that is the kitty. Um, and my who is it? Bandit. My kid Bandit. loves Zoom. She'll be up here on the table soon, too. It's very yeah. odd. Um, and Ken was also instrumental and in part of starting uh, the Our Poetry Critique Society. And that is in part, um, Ken uh, studied with Dick Shelton and um, brought Dick to uh, the Copper Queen Library um, for several workshops. And uh, those workshops for those of us uh, poets and writers studying with Ken, we then benefit, I feel like we're second generation from Dick Shelton, um, the uh, really wonderful combination of um, critique, editing, and honesty. <laughs> so, um, uh, welcome, Ken. Will you tell us about this project you've been working on? Sure. Thanks, Allison, and congratulations for all the amazing work you do there at the Green Library. Well deserved. So, um, this is a, a blog I started at the beginning of the pandemic two years ago, and it um, I call it the Big Yard. And it originally had a, a different subtitle, but now I, I call it the um, Notes of a Pajama Bird Watcher. Because that's what I've evolved into. See, I'm wearing pajamas. This is the way I spend my days sitting in the yard in my pajamas watching birds. But it, it didn't start out that way. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, you know, it'd be fun to to move around Cochise County and see how many birds I could find in the county. And, uh, and I started having reservations about that pretty quickly when I met other people who were flying in from like Boston to see a rare eared Quetzal in the Chiricahua Mountains or, um, or some warbler or something like that. I met this actually this person from Boston three times. So she flew out here three times. And I just started thinking, you know, I'm driving all over the place. I'm contributing to climate change through my tailpipe. And what for? So I can check another bird off my list when I can just, you know, I could just sit in my yard and count the birds there. And so I'd be, um, I went from a, um, a very unhappy um, lister to just a pajama bird watcher. And so I've been blogging about it for, um, uh, I guess, more than a year now. Um, and it's, it's on, um, if you Google my name and Substack, S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K, um, you can find it there if you want to join. It's completely free to see the posts. Um, 
So I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I was backlogged beginning in the beginning of the, of the uh, um, blog, but now I'm all caught up. And what I thought I'd do today is just read a couple of recent posts from it so you can kind of get a feel for it. And then if I can get it to work, I'll show you some of the photographs. Um, a big part of the, the big yard is not just my writing, but also my photography. So I, I sit in the yard with a, with a big camera lens that looks something like this. And, um, and I'm 10 feet away from a fountain, which I built in the backyard specifically for this project. And, uh, and I take pictures of birds. So this is April 9th, 2022. It is a truth universally acknowledged that birding isn't about the wonder of nature and the search for beauty. It is about finding something rare and being the best. This is clear, a clear message I get while reading the big year, Mark um, of, of Maskick's 2004 book about three birders who scour North America on a cutthroat mission to tick off more bird species than anyone else in a calendar year. Some of you might recognize the title in the big year. It was made into a film with um, Jack Black and, uh, and Steve Martin, I think, were in it. And very funny, very funny. I'm thinking about the big year because this past week, 70 miles north of me, a rare Nuttings flycatcher has been drawing hordes of binocular clad people. Bob Masick begins his book with a 1997 sighting of a Nuttings flycatcher near Nogales, a rarity not seen north of the border since, quote, Harry Truman was president and Jackie Robinson was slugging his first home run in an all-star game, end quote. Words of people on the chase. I'll never call myself a birder. Birds are natural. Birders are not. I'm a nature watcher. For me, nature is today's exhaling plumes of juniper pollen, which leak out into the world and stain my skin and penetrate my flesh. Likewise, the birds in my yard share the same air with me. We trade lipids and proteins and nucleic acids, information that my immune system stores in lymph nodes and chromosomes. The birds in this place have infected me, changed me. I feel them in my cells. They are part of me. Which is why the wife says, reading over my shoulder, you always want to migrate. And I thought 41 years of marriage had cured my wanderlust. Imagine jumping in a car or hopping on a plane every time the rare bird alert lights up. I feel the flycatcher's pull, but this morning I sit in the big yard in my pajamas and watch the magic. Seven kinds of hummingbirds crowd the feeders, a male calliope, the most recent arrival. Any moment, a rare Lucifer hummingbird could show. My neighbors say a female has been visiting their yard and the warbler action is picking up. The first Wilsons of the season on its way from coastal Mexico to Northern Canada and Alaska joins the Nashville, Virginia's and Lucy's warblers. 66 species for April has kept the big yard ranked at the top 15, in the top 15 yards in the country on eBird. Why travel anywhere? Bird watching is about connection between the domesticated animal sitting in the chair and the wild animal perched in the tree. This is April 13, 2022. We have a neighborhood watch on Mule Pass, but it's not what you think. No one is reporting suspicious activity to keep the neighborhood safe and reduce crime. We may have suspicious acti activity, but we don't have any crime. In fact, we only lock our cars during zucchini harvest season. No police unless they're bird watchers. No, right now my neighbors are watching for the Lucifer hummingbirds. By mid-April, hummingbirds swarm the feeders like bees. 
Rufus from oak woodlands in southwestern Mexico on their way north to Alaska, Calliope following them as far as the Pacific Northwest. Costas from northern Mexico traveling even less. Others from Mexico and Guatemala, broadbills, broadtails, even the magnificent Rivolis or Rivolis magnificent from Nicaragua. To date, nine species in multiples approaching several dozen birds. The first Lucifer, always a gorgeous, a gorgeous ochre female who come in at number 10. I saw my first Lucifer, a female, life bird number 359 from the bedroom window in 2010. And I've seen them more than 50 times since, but only here. That morning, I thought, what is that? When I glanced at the feeder hanging just beyond the window as the perch bird cocked its head and stared back at me through its mascara and down its long curl of beak. At the time, only a handful of records existed for the hummingbird in the Mule Mountains. According to the Arizona Breeding Bird Atlas, they breed here. So my neighbors are watching the dry, exposed, and steep slopes of our canyon for tiny nests of plant duff and lichen bound together with spider silk. They're listening for the male's loud, whirring courtship as he flares his amethyst throat and forked tail and shuttles above the female at work on her nest for incubating her pair of white eggs. This morning, like every morning all month, I scan each hummingbird hovering at my feeders and flowers, listening for that telltale pitch of lucifer wings like strumming an A string on a bass guitar. The buzz of black chins and rufus turns my head. The buffy flanked female broadtails pull binoculars to my eyes. Is that a drooping bill? When I hear a text tone, I check my messages. Lucy is here, writes my neighbor, adding a starry-eyed emoticon to rub it in. She always gets them first, sometimes weeks ahead of me, like this year. Even though I've raised my sugar concentration, three have been visiting her feeders, but not at mine. I look up and something dark-headed and suspicious zips away, just like the other day, I think. She had invited me to photograph her Lucifer hummingbirds, and after an hour, when finally they showed, I was distracted. I don't believe it, said Lucifer's mistress. You are looking at your phone. So that kind of gives you a little sampling of the blog. They're just short with lots of photographs. And if I can figure it out, I'll, uh, I'll post, I'll show you some of these photographs. Is that working? Can you see that? Yep, it works. So that's the fountain that I was talking about. I call it the COVID fountain. I built it in the early part of the pandemic because I heard that birds like flowing water. And I, I had this kind of a foundation of a pond already there and I just refitted it and planted some monkey flower. So that's growing along the rock there. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the water in that fountain draws more birds than anything else I put out. Um, like, and I'll put seeds out and oranges and jelly for the Orioles. But this fountain has done more for bringing birds to my yard than anything else I've done. The COVID fountain. So this is the famous elegant trogon. And yes, it is a yard bird for me. I mean, most people go to like Madera Canyon or the Chiricahuas or other places to see this bird. And they travel from all over the world to see it. And last year, it was, I think it was actually Easter morning. I was sitting in my yard and this bird flew right over top of my head, underneath the porch, right over top of my head and landed on this gate that I have and cocked its head just a little bit. And I happened to have my camera in my lap and I just picked it up and snapped a few pictures. So it's um, really, really rare for this part. I think there are probably 
few or no records of elegant trogons in the Mule Mountains. This is one of the warblers I get. This is called a Nashville warbler, all yellow in, on the front. Um, they're, they've come in right now. They're here um, pretty much in the morning, sometimes in the evening. One of about 13 species of warblers that I get that come for water in the fountain. Is that working? You can all see those? Yes, yes. It you looks can beautiful. still hear me? <laughs> you can. This is another warbler. This is a, um, a hermit warbler, the male. And he's actually sitting on the fountain there. Or on the cling, cling to the back wall of the fountain. And another warbler, this is called a red-faced warbler. He's up in the, uh, uh, we have a, I have a uh, choke cherry tree that kind of grows to the, uh, to the left of the fountain. This is the Lucy's warbler that I was talking about. My neighbor calls her Lucy because this is the female. So you see that long curl of beak. Um, it's the only hummingbird that we get. I get 12 species here and there's probably 14, maybe 15 species that actually come into the into southeastern Arizona. So, um, but this is the only one that looks with that, that has that long beak like that. And the, the female is pretty much just buffy colored. Um, the male is um, a bit different. And I'll show you a picture of him when I get to him. This is a, 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 a rufous hummingbird, male rufous, that bright red throat. And they're one of the ones that travel the farthest, central, southern Mexico, all the way to Alaska. So they, they're usually the first ones that come through the yard because they have a long way to go. So they show up first probably early March, sometimes as early as February, on their way to the breeding grounds. They don't breed here, but they'll, they, they head to um, like Alaska and the Pacific Northwest to breed. And this is a costas hummingbird, the male costas. Pretty common. You see them a lot in Tucson, even in the wintertime. So this is the male lucifers. So you still got that curl, that long curved beak and that really pretty um, magenta colored, it's called a gorget, the, the throat part. So very rare hummingbird. People come from all over to see them. And it's, it's nice when about, you know, about April, they start showing up in my yard. Um, I have one that visits me every morning now. Um, almost have to be up before sunup to see him. He comes in early and then doesn't come the rest of the day. This is one of the photographs I took at my neighbor's yard because she had three of them while I had none at the time. She calls herself um, Lucifer's mistress. Here's another picture of the, probably the same bird. These guys just showed up the other day. I rarely see them here. Um, but they're all over Bisbee. I mean, they love the pyracantha berries in Bisbee. Anybody know what this is? You seen them in Bisbee? Cedar wax wings? I love it when I can get a picture where the, the bird actually shows some kind of personality. Like he's looking right at me and he's saying, what are you doing taking my picture? And the Orioles, I get three Orioles and they've all come in now. Um, this is the Bullock's Oriole. And you can see I put an orange out and sometimes I'll put some jelly out. He's got a beak full of jelly, it looks like. And, uh, and they're pretty much there um, this time of year all day long, feeding on oranges and jelly. And they'll breed here. So they'll, they'll come through and, and find a mate and then um, and then build their nests. Same thing with the hooded Orioles. Um, they've all just come in. There's a, a mated pair that I have that comes, you know, pretty much all day long here. This is the male. Um, the bullocks, that was the male bullocks too. And this is a, this guy just came in this morning. I got his picture. It's a, uh, 
um, uh, Hutton's Vireo. So I get all kinds of Vireos, warbling Vireos, um, Plumius Vireos. I love these names. A lot of them have to do with the color of them, like Plumius is the color of lead, right? That's the Latin for lead is Plumus or something like that. So, uh, but this is named for um, some guy, uh, I forget who, um, named Hutton. So a lot of birds are named after um, kind, of, kind of famous ornithologists in the past. And there's been a trend now um, to, to uh, move away from that. Um, I mean, why, why name a bird for some dead guy when you can, you know, have a really cool name like, uh, you know, rosy-breasted pushover or something. And this is a western tanager. They just also just recently arrived. Um, sometimes I post these birds. I post on eBird, which is kind of a, um, it's a, I don't know, crowdsourcing um, website for bird watchers. Um, sometimes like when I first put this guy up, um, like last week when, when they first arrived, it was a rare bird at that time. It was early, so um, it was on the rare bird alert. I have all kinds of birds that end up in my yard on the rare bird alert. Like the Lucifer, every day I put the Lucifer up, he's a rare bird, he goes on the rare bird alert. And this is a kind of, this is a, actually a rare sparrow called a, a clay colored sparrow. And he showed up in the yard last year. I haven't seen him since, but um, beautiful. He has that kind of that cheek patch um, is what is a diagnostic feature. And then the clay coloring. Um, but yeah, he, you know, when he showed up in the yard, he was on the rare bird alert too. So, Anyway, um, I'm happy to address any questions you might have or just blather on about anything. Talk about my books, talk about my birds. You know, it's been a great thing for the um, pandemic, you know, because, you know, without um, traveling anywhere, it, it, you know, I could sit in the yard for three hours in the morning and, and, uh, and the time just flies by. You never know what to expect. Um, the, the yard just can bring in anything like an elegant trogon. You just never know, you know. So it's it's actually kind of exciting. You know, you see a little bit of movement. It's like, what is that? Ken, where is your yard? So I'm in the Mule Mountains. I'm just outside of Bisbee. Um, I'm on the other side of the, the tunnel, about a mile. Actually, I'm, I'm a mile from the tunnel on the west side. So it's uh, officially called Banning Creek right through here. Um, but, uh, and, uh, the, the, it, I call it Mule Pass or, um, you know, well, the road is named, you know, Mule Pass. So Mule Mountains, Mule Pass, and it's just right off Mule Pass. And your house is somewhat well known, right? Isn't it a historic, uh, building? I remember when I first moved here, I, uh, driving down the mountain, the, isn't it built of the little yeah, stones? Yeah, it's a, it's a stone house. It was built in the 1890s. It's on the old Mule Road um, between 1880 and 1890 before the, the rail system came in. Um, they, had to, they had to haul all that copper ore out by mule train. 20 team mules brought it up over the divide and right down in this road right in front of my house. I mean, I'm sitting, you know, 20 feet from it. You know, and so um, people had built these little, you know, one one room cabins along the way, I guess, either as stopping places to um, rest the mules or to water the mules or for people to stay. And so there's a couple of them right along here on these, these you know, what were originally one room stone houses that, that have been added on over the years. Um, the reason we know this one was built in the 1890s is because there was a newspaper that was pulled out of one of the walls a few years back by a previous owner. And, uh, and it, it, was, uh, it, it was from the 1890s the newspaper. But um, yeah, so it's been added on since then. In the, in the 50s, the room was added. And in, in the 70s, you know, the kitchen area was added. But it's, it's uh, nothing even, you know, like 
like a lot of things in Bisbee, there's nothing flat, right? So everywhere you go, you got to go up or down steps. You know? But it's a it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, my wife and I fell in love with it when we first saw it, and um, and I've been doing a lot of work on it since then, mostly um, with the plumbing, which is ancient. And we have a well that um, that is kind of seasonal, so um, so it needs a lot of work. So I do a lot of rainwater collection and uh, and and well work. You know, there's a couple different well heads around, so I try to you know keep the water flowing, keep the garden green as much as I can. But the wildlife here is fantastic. I mean, mountain lions, bear, the coati, of course, um, javelina, deer, I mean, just in the yard every day. Is the, how, what, how is your fountain fed? Is that from the wells? So, yeah, so the, the it just holds, it's, it's got that pool in the front of it. So it holds maybe probably 40, 50 gallons of water and there's a recircling pump in there that keeps the water flowing. And so I, I probably have to use maybe um, two gallons of water a day to kind of keep it topped up. So yeah, especially when it starts getting dry like it is now, I mean, we're moving into our four summer drought, right? We've had, le we've had less than an inch of rain. It's really horrible. This is the, the worst, the driest it's been since I've lived here, since the 12 years that I've lived here. This is the driest it's been. And, and fire season, man, we're, and we're just primed. I mean, ready, as you know, you know, did, did anybody else get the midnight phone call last night with the Bisbee fire? I did, you know, it's like we had to be set to go to evacuate in case they lost control of it. You know? um, somebody took some beautiful pictures of it, but I guess it's all under control now, last I heard. That is the, that is the, the statement that has been put out, which is great. And, you know, our um, firefighters, our first responders, all the other fire departments, I think we're so lucky here in Bisbee because we are so vulnerable, but um, all of the teams who come together to fight that and especially stopped it from uh, jumping the highway, right. you know, onto all the houses, that was really impressive. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, I was here with, the, we had a fire up on Mule Pass, remember that, the Mule Pass fire? Yeah. And, uh, and those crews, I mean, I could see them from the house working all night long, you know, cutting those fire breaks and then uh, the slurry bombers, you know, coming in and dropping slurry all over us to keep the fire kind of contained. And they do amazing work, those guys. The, the fire, we're part of the Firewise group and we have, um, we have those guys come in here and actually clear our properties um, of brush and extra, you know, down dead wood so that, um, you know, to protect us from, you know, the big one. But I mean, it's just, you can only do so much, you know, in Down Canyon from this, it, it's pretty thick with brush and trees. Yeah. Stay safe out there, everybody. Good time to really be conscientious. Um, Ken, I have been wondering if, uh, the big yard if these uh, missives are going to be turned into a book? Yeah, I'm actually working on that right now. There's a, um, a couple presses that have expressed some interest in it. I, I never thought that, you know, a blog would make for a nice book. So I, I'm going to have to do something a little different, I think, so that it's less, you know, um, episodic, less blog-like. You know? But um, and probably it would have fewer, you know, pictures, photography, especially color photography, is really expensive to reproduce. So um, I'll have to figure out how to deal with that. Maybe, maybe it will be mostly text, and then I'll set up uh, an online place where people can go to, you know, look at pictures. I don't know. I'm still thinking it through. I'm still kind of working out, you know, how I want um, the structure of it um, as a book. But uh, Arizona Illustrated has been here. Um, they came down, the guys came down, Tony Paniagua and, uh, and his um, photojournalist came down in January, February, and spent two days down here um, taking pictures, mostly of me walking around with my big lens and of the birds and things like that. So I think um, last I heard, it's gonna be in May. So next month, it's supposed to be 
uh, alibis, I guess, on, on Arizona Elm Street next month, which is kind of cool. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, um, books like the, the Big Year are made into movies because, you know, they turn bird watching into this competitive, you know, cutthroat sport, right? Where there's this competition between, you know, three bird watchers that are flying and, and traveling all over, you know, the United States to get, you know, that, that bird. So, you know, sitting in your backyard watching birds doesn't make much for television. I think. So, <laughs> I did uh, show I mean, that movie a few years ago at the library during the birder, when the birders came to Bisbee for the week, I showed that movie it was really fun. <laughs> Um, and uh, they were serving chicken sandwiches to all the burgers. Yeah, perfect. perfect. It was also yeah. um, amusing. Um, well, one of the things I find really interesting, especially you know at the beginning when you started this blog, um, uh, almost these diary entries, is that while you're looking at birds, it's very much COVID related. The um, the what we were doing especially in 2020 um which was such a rough year but uh you know that they're not separate things that the um lockdown the isolation um your wife works in the healthcare and business and and was you know right there at the front and really um all the information that we were and were not getting trying to figure out uh, where we were as communities and as a country, and then how we took care of ourselves, our own mental health, our own well-being, and finding things to, um, you know, support that and lessen anxiety. I feel like there are threads of that all running through it that are very important to, to each day's story. Yeah, I don't, I don't shy away from it at all. I talk a lot about the pandemic and what's going on. I mean, I, I lost family, relatives, I mean, dead on the side of the road in Colorado, my, my daughter's in-laws, you know, from COVID, you know. And, and you know, and, and watching birds migrate, right? Viruses migrate. So there's, there's all these, you know, parallels that I can kind of, you know, dive into, you know, you know, the people, you know, traveling around to look at birds, you know, like, like viruses and spreading viruses, you know, it's just like all this craziness. So it was, it was interesting for me to kind of look at, um, look at a larger picture. It's not just about bird watching, you know, it's about what's going on in the world. And, and, you know, I talk a lot about climate change, you know, and because it affects not just, you know, not just us, it affects everything, right? It affects the planet, it affects the wildlife, it affects the birds migrating. I mean, birds are now migrating and dying because they're, they're moving into areas where the, you know, the insect population that they depend on has already bloomed and died off, you know, because the planet is warmer there. You know? So, um, you know, so there's, you know, there's all kinds of threads like that. And that's what I'm looking at now, trying to figure out you know, how I would shape the, the blog as a book, you know, how I would put those threads together and, uh, and make it bigger than just, you know, some guy sitting in his backyard in his pajamas, you know, watching birds. Although that so, would make a that, good cover, a good book cover to yeah. have yeah. some guy. Me in my his, pajamas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, my, with my big camera lens, you know, yeah. I have wondered yeah, about well, your camera actually because of the intensity and the detail in your photos. They're just so amazing what you have captured. So it's really cool to see that lens. Does anybody yeah, else have any questions or comments for Ken? Um, well, oh, can I make a comment? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I was just wondering if you have noticed uh, some of the behaviors of the birds 
And, you know, like, do the warblers have a different kind of behavior than the cedar wax wings? And, you know, is there something sort of intriguing that you notice through your observations about that? They, they, every bird has like its own personality. And I, I can tell if it's this, the same bird coming day after day, just because of its personality. The, there's certain, like the Lincoln sparrows always come to the fountain and they always climb down on the left side to get to the water in the pool, you know, whereas the cedar wax queens, they'll never climb down to the pool, you know, they'll climb up to the, the top of the fountain and drink right out of the very top of the fountain. So, and, and you can, you know, when I get the pictures and I look at the birds up close, you can see that they're, you know, sometimes I think, you know, I just snap a picture and then I look at them later and I'm going, this, this bird is looking right through me. The, the, um, we have Gould's turkeys here that I'm partially responsible for um, because I worked with the Game and Fish on getting some toms brought in, but they've just come through. There are four toms and three hens and the toms are doing their thing. I mean, they're strutting. I can see their tracks going all up and down the road where they're dragging their wings, following some poor hen, trying to get her attention. And, and those birds, they look right at you and they have a, the personality that you can separate out. You can say, oh, I recognize you and I recognize you. I know who you are, you know? So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. You know, if you just sit for a while and pay attention, you know, it's, it, that's why they call it bird watching, right? Not birding. You know, I'm not checking off some other warbler that just came in the yard. I'm paying attention to, you know, these, these, um, the species like the orange crowns, you know, that come in and spend a half hour bathing in the pond and then they fly up into the tree and they spend another half hour preening, you know? And so it's, it's about, you know, watching them, you know, go through their lives and, and in a way participating in it, you know? I provide water, you know, the hummingbirds freak out if I don't come out first thing in the morning and fill, I have a little, um, a little statue fountain that I have to fill all the way up to the brim because the hummingbirds, they can't, they're a little tiny bird, they can't get down in there if the water level is two inches below the rim. So I have to come out and I have to fill right up to the brim so that they can take a bath. They, then they sit on the lip of the, the little fountain and then they take a bath, you know, the funniest thing. And my wife swears that if a hummingbird feeder goes empty, the hummingbirds come looking for them. Wherever I am, they come looking for them. You need to put more sugar in the feeder. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's the behavior is it's just wild. It's it's fun to watch. And it's, so Ken, they're all they all got different personalities. Ken, have you noticed that it's the female hummers that come um, find you? That's what my observation is. That they're smarter than the males as to who to go to for <laughs> fresh food. So so you had that same effect. Huh? The the hummingbirds come looking for you when a feeder goes empty. Uh, yeah, they yeah. know who's in charge. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about it, it's the it's the females, which are, are harder, you know, to um, identify. The males are so easy, you know, you see them, you know, you can see them because of their colors. The females all kind of look the same. You know? But um, yeah, I, I tell people don't don't be too concerned about all the identifications, you know, just you know, learn a couple of species and work from there. You know? So yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Do, do you have my um, go ahead, Bushy. Okay, I, I had a couple of questions. Do you have any uh, special? I mean, are you just using regular, like standard um, hummingbird feeders? And also, are you supplementing uh, any uh, bird seed or anything uh, in your area to attract different types of birds? I I was using a, a bird seed a few years ago that had um, cranberries and nuts and things in it. And that's the only time I think I had a trogan in my yard. But when I looked at the contents of that seed, there was like sugars and other things added. And I'm like, this, it didn't seem natural. <laughs> yeah, so I use a variety of, of different um, seeds. You know, the Orioles and the Tanagers love oranges, and that's an easy thing to do. You just slice them in half and stick them somewhere. 
you know, and they also like grape jelly. I don't know what it is about grape jelly, but I've tried other ones, you know, like I run out of grape jelly and I try strawberry. Nah, they're not going to eat the strawberry. They want grape. Got to be grape jelly. You know, weird. Um, tanagers, Orioles love that stuff. And the, and the finches do too. So um, I use, um, I get the, because it's, it, it seems um, less expensive to get the block. So I get seed blocks like an ACE, you know, and some of those, I think what you're talking about, they have the fruit in them and things like that. They seem to work better because the birds have to work at it. They won't just gorge, you know, if I put like a, you know, I fill a feeder full of sunflower seeds, it'll be gone, you know, in a couple hours because the birds just gorge on it, especially the doves. And the doves yeah. don't, they, they can't seem to handle the seed block. You know, and it's and it's nice. It's compact. Uh -oh. You get a couple of different varieties of them. Um, a big thing is suet. I mean, I use a I use, I get the uh, like the orange and the berry flavored suets because a lot of birds um, they especially in the winter time um, need that suet, that fat, that extra fat content, and it attracts. You know, the suet attracts everything from uh, you know little nut hatches to um, you know um, even sparrows. And raccoons. <laughs> and yeah, I have I have problems. I don't have raccoons, but I have coati. And they can figure anything out. I mean, the, the, these feeders will hang in a tree and they'll be able to pull on the line to, to get it up. And then they'll open up the container that the suet is in and pull it out. I mean, I've, I've seen them do it. I have a, an old ladder that belongs in a well out here. And I've seen them walk up that ladder to get into the tree to get to the feeders. Yeah, the Kawadi are a problem. Kodamundi, people call them. You know, they can, uh, you know, they'll they'll grab a hold of a feeder and they'll lift it off and they'll drop it down on the ground and smash it so that they can get to the seeds. It's crazy. You know? yeah. So yeah, suet, um, some seeds. Thistle is a big one. Um, a lot of birds like the thistle seed. It's kind of expensive, usually about $20, $25 a bag. Um, but um, you can put it in a sock or a thistle feeder and you'll get a lot of the gold finches and pine siskins. I got pine siskins out there right now. I have uh, birds from my office window, um, bird feeders set up so that I can see if anything is coming in while I'm, you know, it's kind of a distraction. Actually, I do a lot less writing and more bird watching, I think. Yeah. And then for the hummingbirds, it's just sugar water, um, you know, one quarter sugar to, uh, you know, one, one fourth, you know, quarter, quarter sugar, whatever it is, per gallon, you know. So, um, and unless your neighbors have it, then I try to increase the sugar content, and try to bring the hummingbirds in. So, Thank you. So you are yeah. competing then? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what my neighbor says. She says, I read your blog and I think you're a birder because you count. I'm like, yeah, but I don't, I don't chase. I'm not chasing birds. I'm just, I'm counting them. And, and she says, yeah, but, but did you really increase your sugar concentration because of me? Well, yeah, I did. And now I have <laughs> Lucifer hummingbirds coming to my yard, probably coming from your yard. You know, so what she'll do, of course, is she'll up her sugar concentration. You know, so we'll have this little, you know, war, the sugar little water. battle going back and forth. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Hi, Beth. I had another meeting. I, I'm sorry, I, I should have been here. Uh, it's fine, we'll be <laughs> finishing up and I will put it on. Um, but uh, Ken, do you want to, uh, it, this blog is on Substack, right? Yeah. So. So it's um, www.kenlamberton.substack.com. You can find me there. And you just uh, put in your email and subscribe and you'll receive uh, the latest in your inbox every day. It's a real delight to read. Um, really just uh, such beautiful moments captured and uh, you know, going back to what you were saying about um, the kind of macro of this, this activity and your observations, but also seeing the larger things. I just, I, I really appreciate your insight and um, the way that um, there's, you know, more than one story as you move through 
um, what you see that day. It's, it's a really beautiful um, introspective and also, um, you know, kind of bigger thing through the, these, uh, I, I kind of like journal entries as opposed to blog, but it is a blog, I get it. <laughs> But well, yeah, I, I hesitated even using that term because it's, I never really saw it as a blog. You know, I started it as, you know, yeah, as a journal, as keeping a journal. It was, was my oldest daughter who put me onto Substack and said, Dad, you should be putting this stuff, you know, out there for people to read. You know, my, Substack's my journal really and and uh, I think the Substackers, they just, they don't call them blogs. They call them their, their st Substacks. Um, but I do think it would be really uh, a gift to readers everywhere to uh, to capture it and and hold it in a book form. I, th I think it would make a really beautiful book. So I'm a big fan. Um, but I also do just want to honor uh, the poetic side of your writing, Ken. Uh, just listening to you again, you know, you you craft sentences so beautifully. And you really bring such vivid imagery, concrete imagery, into these bigger things. It's just really a delight. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you, and also it's nice of you to see. And um, hopefully we will have some more readings uh, in the future that could be in person. And um, I would just like to ask everybody to save the date for Friday, May thirteenth. 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. will be our first big event since uh, 2020. Uh, the Ice Cream Social at the Copper Queen Library Annex, which will also be a ribbon cutting for our new childhood patio and a literacy fair and a pre-summer reading program registration with live music by Jessica Fleet and a big story time with Kids Need to Read and free ice cream. Did I say that? That's the most important part. Please come have some free ice cream and uh, be social with us on May 13th. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you again, Ken. Always a pleasure to- Thank you, Allison. Amazing nice. work you do there. Thank you. Thank you.